in many cultures, distant in place or time from our own. There are special plants that give rise to strange visions and hallucinations. Experiences we associate with illegal drugs, but which for these other cultures are thought to be a gateway to another world. For 20 years, ever since I began my career as an archaeologist and anthropologist at Oxford, I've been engaged in a search to rediscover the lost world of sacred plants, for almost nothing is known about them today. The most famous of all these hallucinogenic plants is perhaps fly agaric, a familiar red and white mushroom that has intrigued me ever since I became aware of its ancient history. Part of the same family as the death cap toadstool, the fresh mushroom is highly poisonous, but has been used by Siberian tribes from time immemorial to induce a state of trance. And the hallucinatory effects of this mushroom are thought to have been the basis for the experiences of Alice in Wonderland. To try to uncover the mysteries of the mushroom, I assembled a group of specialists, all with their own expertise. A series of experiments was conducted that had never been previously attempted. Volunteers would, under strict medical supervision, take a controlled dose of these poisonous plants. And I would record everything that happened over the next three days of the experiment. I'm sort of wondering, like, you know, what's, what's going on? <laughs> what is it making it do this? How is it working? inside my mind, you know, what chemicals are these, why do they exist at all? What happens when these mushrooms are taken? What are their toxic effects? Yeah, yeah, definitely happening again. And how do the effects of the mushroom relate to their sacred status in some cultures? As I welcomed my guests to Hammerwood Park, we began to talk of the fly agaric, the red and white mushroom we all know well from fairy tales. Yes. Well, I've been, I've been trying to get back for all those years. Right. Um, well, it's a great place. What might my guests discover about this mushroom? A mushroom that has been linked for thousands of years to a world of elves and leprechauns and other little people. The team I had assembled had very different outlooks. Cosmo Holstrom, a consultant psychiatrist and senior lecturer at Imperial College, was interested in how the active chemicals in the mushroom affected the brain and was well versed in the risks involved in taking hallucinogens. While Joanna Itten wanted to measure the effects of the mushroom on sensation and perception. Previously a research scientist at Cambridge, she joined us from Senna's Cognition, a company specialising in these psychological tests. And finally, I was very pleased that Michael Carmichael was able to join us. One of the few people to have made a special study of the cultural use of the fly agaric, an ethnobotanist, Michael would approach the subject from a very different perspective, giving weight to the personal experiences of those who had taken the mushroom. I began by giving my guests a brief background on this strange plant. Well, here it is, Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric. That's what it looks like growing in real life, but we've also got a dried specimen here. I'm going to pass it round, but you better not handle it too much because some of the active substances can adhere to your fingers and might be accidentally ingested. The mushroom grows throughout the northern hemisphere, but the best evidence that we have for its use comes from here in the eastern part of Siberia but there are also indications 
but it was used in North America. During its long history, fly agaric has often been highly prized. Some of the psychoactive elements in the mushroom are excreted into the urine. An early account of the use of fly agaric describes how poor members of the tribe would, on occasions when the mushroom was being taken, stand outside the homes of the better off with a wooden bowl to receive the urine, which they're said to have drunk with great enthusiasm. It continues to have a special place in the cultures of Siberia, where it's used by several tribes, such as the Chukchi and the Koryak, as part of the ceremonies associated with shamanism. Shamans are people with a special role in society who have special access to the spirit world and go into trance as a result of the use of this mushroom. I then moved on to the appearance of the fly agaric mushroom in our own culture. And this is the famous example from Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, the caterpillar sitting on the mushroom, and Alice bites a little piece of this to get larger and smaller. So there is some evidence that Lewis Carroll himself was aware of some of the properties of eating these mushrooms and the way in which it altered perception. And so the image of the fly agaric became very common in Victorian literature, especially associated with fairies and little people sitting on mushrooms or toadstools. So nowadays, this image is one which is very widespread. Then I turn to the focus of our investigation. What is it about the effects of eating this mushroom that makes it so central to religious practices in Siberia that seems to make the spirit world so real? And is it possible that this is what lies behind the persistent association of this mushroom in our culture with elves and fairies and little people? Well, let me turn first of all to Michael Carmichael. You've made a special study of these mushrooms. What do you think? Andrew, I think that this mushroom represents a golden key to the doors of perception that open into a new world of experience. In fact, we have some rare footage taken in Siberia of a shaman who has used the mushrooms to transform their perception, permitting them to enter into a separate reality that is populated by a myriad of extraordinary beings or creatures that are frequently called little people, fairies, elves, leprechauns. And it's this phenomenon that correlates precisely with the European association between mushrooms and fairyland. Cosmo, a psychiatrist view. Well, I think as a psychiatrist, one has to be skeptical, especially because you deal with people all day long with strange ideas and uh, funny views. As a clinical pharmacologist, I think one gets more interested. One has to be thinking about what the mechanism can be for uh, this, this action. For example, we know the active ingredient of fly aragic is muscimol, and here we have some in here. We know that muscimol potently binds to the GABA-A receptor, which is a neurotransmitter. It's a receptor, it's a chemical that's an inhibitory action in the brain. And how that then translates into people seeing little people, well, that's another question. Already, Cosmo's scientific realism and his hypothesis of mental inhibition or distortion was in marked contrast to Michael's more subjective understanding of the mushroom as a gateway to other aspects of reality. 